Good morning. I'm very, very delighted to chair this morning's session. And uh, we have three presentations. Each presentation will last 30 minutes, followed by 15 minutes questions. So I'm, with great pleasure, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Klaus Meinzer from Technical University of Munich, who will be talking about the emergence of symmetries in classical physics. Please join me to welcome Professor Meinzer. Thank you. Good morning, uh, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to uh, start uh, this conference on uh, symmetries in uh, physics with a talk on uh, the emergence of symmetries in uh, classical uh, physics. And uh, it is on uh, the background of, um, uh, of uh, research and uh, publications for uh, several years. Uh, I will start with some remarks on uh, symmetry and harmony from antiquity to renaissance and the mathematical concept of symmetries. And then uh, we will consider symmetry, the emergence of symmetry of space-time, conservation law, uh, and uh, variation principles in classical mechanics. And I will um, end with some remarks on perspectives of symmetry as research principle. Let us start with symmetry and harmony from antiquity to uh, uh, Renaissance. And here I like to uh, remind you uh, of uh, Plato's uh, cosmos, uh, which is a centrally, symmetrically ordered system with the Earth in the center here on the left. Uh, soon moon and planets turn on spheres. And uh, in that time, that seemed to be uh, obvious from an, for an observer uh, on, uh, on the Earth. And according to uh, the Platonic uh, Pythagorean uh, conception, the uh, 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 proportions, the proportions of uh, the celestial spheres uh, seem to be in uh, uh, harmony with uh, the strings here of uh, a Greek uh, lyre. So symmetry and harmony not only in science but also in uh, art. And in that uh, Platonic uh, tradition, the observed retrograde movements are considered a symmetry breaking of uh, cosmic harmony. And um, Plato himself was horrified by that. And he asked the mathematicians of his time uh, to save the phenomena, to save uh, symmetry. And uh, actually, the mathematicians came up with uh, uh, remarkable uh, solutions. Um, a well-known uh, solution is here with uh, epicycle and uh, uh, different, that means with uh, uh, circular uh, uniform uh, movements. But the central symmetry is uh, given up. But uh, anyway, any kind of uh, uh, observed um, movement uh, on, uh, on the heaven in that time could be mathematically exactly uh, explained by uh, these kind of uh, uniform circular uh, movements. But uh, in the end, in the Middle Ages, uh, the astronomers uh, had generated a very complicated computus was it called in Latin in the Middle Ages, but without any uh, physical uh, explanation. And so uh, the introduction uh, in modern times of the heliocentric uh, model was mainly motivated by uh, arguments of simplification by central symmetry. Again, uh, Copernicus, well known. And uh, by that, the retrograde um, uh, planetary movements could be interpreted uh, as effects of uh, the Earth's uh, movement. And that is a nice um, illustration of the symmetry and heliocentric cosmology in the midst of uh, the 17th uh, century. Now, um, symmetry not only in the macrocosmos, but also in the microcosmos, in uh, Plato's dialogue, uh, Timaios, uh, the uh, uh, five distinguished regular bodies in Euclidean geometry um, were uh, identified with uh, the um, uh, physical principles, the physical elements uh, in that time. Uh, that was, of course, um, 
um, a speculation. But uh, anyway, uh, scientists until the beginning of modern times were um, fascinated by the regular bodies and uh, even Kepler uh, tried to uh, explain uh, the distances of the celestial spheres in the heliocentric model by, embedded, uh, by embedding uh, regular uh, bodies, at least in the beginning of his uh, academic uh, career. So uh, again, symmetry and harmony, not only in science, but also in arts. And renaissance is, can also be understood as a renaissance of uh, mathematical uh, symmetry in uh, science and in arts here, the symmetry of the Leonardo world. Now, all these uh, ancient uh, uh, examples uh, can be explained by modern concepts of uh, uh, symmetry. For example, here following Hermann Weil, the symmetry of a set is, a, is defined by the group of self-mattings, uh, automorphisms, that uh, leaves unchanged the structure of the set uh, with the identity and uh, the existence of uh, uh, inversive uh, automorphisms and uh, successive applications of the automorphisms. And by that, uh, all these uh, nice examples from antiquity in Euclidean geometry, mirror symmetry, similarities, congruences can be uh, explained. And uh, even uh, ornaments, uh, for example, here for one dimension, the so-called frieze uh, ornaments uh, can be explained by a combination of uh, symmet uh, symmetrical uh, transformations. I will not go here in uh, the details, also true for two uh, dimensions, the ornamental groups of uh, the plane, but uh, the proof that exactly only uh, 17 uh, examples are uh, possible in the plane. That is, of course, uh, mathematical stuff of the uh, 20th century. Paul Ya, for example, uh, with his uh, um, well-known uh, proof. Uh, classifications of crystals, symmetries of crystals, were already uh, done in, uh, since the midst of the uh, 19th uh, century. And here, the uh, distinction between discrete and continuous uh, rotational groups and uh, the explanations of the uh, platonic uh, uh, bodies by uh, group theoretical uh, considerations. So from a mathematical point of, uh, you, uh, point of uh, view, the um, uh, mathematical uh, tools of uh, symmetry which were applied in the 20th century uh, physics were already generated in the 18th, 19th and the early uh, 20th uh, century. For example, here um, um, Felix Klein's uh, Erlanger program, geometry is considered a study of the invariance of group actions which uh, later on um, uh, led to uh, invariant theory, algebraic geometry in mathematics, uh, geometric algebras and the tensor spinous differential forms, or uh, group representational theory, very important for quantum mechanics in 20th century, Lie groups and algebras. Uh, by the way, in mathematics, uh, the application of symmetry transformations um, uh, uh, was already uh, exercised in the beginning of the 19th century with the Galois theory and applications in number theory and theory of uh, equations. Now with that in mind, let us consider the emergence of symmetry of space and time in uh, classical uh, mechanics. And here I start, of course, with uh, uh, Newton's uh, Principia, and uh, according to that, material bodies move in an absolutely uh, stationary uh, space due to their inertia and gravity according to the axioms of uh, mechanics. And Newton distinguished uh, relative time from the absolute time of absolute uh, space. And uh, this is a mathematical structure of uh, his space-time uh, invariant theory. In the absolute space with absolute time, it is decidable for two events whether they occur absolutely simultaneous or not. And therefore, time t here um, uh, can be represented by this uh, vertical axis. And uh, here for um, 
uh, for illustration, the three-dimensional layers of simultaneous uh, events uh, are uh, represented by two-dimensional planes. And uh, these layers represent the respective present, uh, separating the past from uh, the future, and here again the vertical axis for representing absolute rest of the uh, absolute uh, space and uh, uniform motion by uh, sloping uh, straight uh, lines and acceleration here by the curve. For the great competitor of Newton on the continent, Leibniz, um, space is only a system of geometrical relations between bodies that has no ontological um, on its own. And so uh, Leibniz is mainly a mathematician, not a physicist in the modern, in the modern sense, and a philosopher. And in contrast to Newton, he emphasizes the relativity of all points of space and time. But that has also uh, severe uh, disadvantages. That is illustrated here in, his, uh, uh, in the uh, mathematical structure of his time, space-time uh, theory because uh, he uh, cannot explain by his, his kinematic principle of relativity dynamic effects, uh, such as the occurrence of centrifugal forces in uh, uh, circular uh, motion. So here is no uh, vertical um, line. So uh, in the modern, that means since the 19th century, representation of the mathematical uh, space-time structure of classical mechanics, there is no vertical axis here because uh, absolute space was given up. It was contrary to uh, Newton's research principle, which he um, uh, requested uh, himself, namely hypothesis non fingo, the absolute space could not be uh, observed. And uh, it is absolute space is now here uh, replaced by the class of all inertial um, movements by straight lines moving uniformly relative to each other. And in contrast to Leibniz, the accelerations can be uh, distinguished uh, from uh, this. So uh, inertial systems since the 19th century are reference systems for force-free bodies moving uh, along straight lines with uh, uniform velocity. Mechanical laws are preserved, that means invariant, with respect to all inertial systems moving uniformly relative to one another. And that means Galilean transformation with this uh, well-known uh, symmetry transformation. And um, in the second part of uh, the 19th century, uh, there was already a formulation or a request of a classical principle of relativity. It was uh, announced by uh, Ludwig Lange, 1885, and this uh, paper uh, has influence to uh, Einstein himself uh, for uh, special uh, relativity. Now, um, uh, con um, uh, considering the mathematical uh, formulation of uh, classical mechanics since the second part of the 18th century in France in analytical mechanics by Lagrange, uh, for example, uh, this kind of formulation opens uh, new possibility to introduce new mathematical, new physical concepts mathematically. Um, uh, for example, the field uh, concept. Carl Friedrich Gauss in 1840 determined the potential of a continuous gravitational field as a solution of the Poisson equation, which was already introduced by Poisson in 1812, with felt field in the density of mass, gravitational constant, and the Laplace operator. Now the Galilean invariance or co-invariance of the field uh, equation is proven by Galilei transformation. And that is again a nice bridge uh, into the uh, 20th century physics because the Poisson uh, field equation offers the possibility to develop Einstein's field equation with his Einstein's uh, equivalence uh, principle. Symmetry uh, of time is not uh, restricted to uh, classical physics. 
T symmetry is a symmetry of uh, physical laws under the transformation of time reversal and Newton's law of inertia is a uh, first example. In uh, analytical uh, mechanics, a mechanical system is now represented by uh, its uh, Lagrangian uh, function, which is invariant with respect to uh, these transformations of uh, time uh, reversal. This is a short outlook on symmetry breaking of time. Time asymmetries generally are caused by one of these three categories. Uh, first, intrinsic to the dynamic uh, physical law. Uh, that is, of course, stuff of the 20th century uh, with respect to the weak force. Second, due to the identical, to the initial uh, conditions of the universe, that is a discussion which already came up in the second part of the 19th century in context of the second law of uh, thermodynamics, uh, for example, um, uh, discussed by uh, Maxwell and uh, others. And uh, third, due to measurements, and especially with uh, quantum measurements, that is, of course, um, uh, stuff of uh, 20th century uh, physics. Now, um, <laughs> amazing. Uh, argument in the end of uh, my remarks on the symmetry of uh, space and time in that time. Um, in the midst of the 18th century, Kant, the uh, uh, philosopher, came up with an amazing uh, argument, the early Kant, because in that time he was convinced, still convinced, by uh, Newton's uh, absolute space, and he tried to prove the existence of the absolute space by what he called an absolute difference of left and right. But uh, already Leibniz, with his uh, principle of sufficient reason, argued that there are no sufficient reason to distinguish left and right in a homogeneous and isotropic space. And you know, in modern relativi relativistic cosmology, uh, models um, uh, to uh, uh, describe the expanding universe are uh, mainly uh, isotropic. Anyway, parity violation uh, gave reasons of uh, anisotropy in the microcosmos of el elementary particles, and then in the next step uh, to the discussions in uh, chemistry by, uh, uh, if, uh, with respect to uh, the concept of uh, chirality. Now, uh, uh, conservation law. And we will hear in uh, uh, talks uh, uh, later on a lot of uh, um, uh, important uh, impact by Emmy Noether in the beginning of the, um, eight, of the 20th century. Now, uh, the discussion on the conservation uh, law of what we call now energy uh, started uh, in the end of the uh, 17th uh, century. And uh, here again, Leibniz, uh, the conservation law, as an integral principle. And that is very interesting to uh, consider the influence of mathematics for, um, for uh, uh, physics. Uh, in a uh, paper uh, in the end of the 17th century, he uh, explained how, in modern terms, potential energy is continuously transformed into kinetic uh, energy, which is uh, here illustrated in the well-known example of uh, the ideal pendulum. And in Latin, he wrote, vis est viva ex infinitis, vis mortue impressionibus continuatis nata, uh, which means that uh, vis viva, we would now, in his term, in English, uh, vis viva is living force, and potential in energy is what he called dead force, vis uh, mortua. Vis viva is generated through continuous accumulation of infinitesimal instances of uh, vis uh, mortua, and that means by integration. So uh, the uh, merit of uh, him is that he explains how, uh, in modern terms, kinetic energy emerge, namely by integration, which is uh, uh, here uh, explained in the framework of his infinitesimal uh, calculus. Here's the V to the uh, square. 
And uh, for Leibniz, the conservation law of kinetic energy is founded by what he calls the principle of sufficient reason. And this is uh, an expression of his search for symmetry and harmony. For Newton, vis viva was a mystical uh, term and only mv, uh, the quantity of motion was considered as a measurable term uh, which uh, is assumed to be conserved. And here is in the tradition of Descartes. Descartes also argued for that in the context of uh, the uh, collision law. And according to Newton, and here again he is in the tradition of uh, Descartes, uh, required God to keep the universe from collapsing by friction and loss of uh, energy. Now, these thought experiments of Leibniz in a mathematical and uh, perhaps metaphysical framework were transformed into empirical uh, experiments in the beginning of the 18th uh, century by um, the uh, uh, Italian uh, physicist Polini and uh, the Dutch uh, physicist uh, Gravesand. And Gravesand uh, um, uh, published uh, the results of a series of experiments. I will not go here in the details in which uh, brass balls were uh, dropped here from varying heights onto a soft uh, clay surface. Now, by that, he had uh, measures for uh, measurement for uh, vis uh, viva. Emile du Châtelet, uh, by the way, together with Voltaire, very influential uh, in the midst of the 18th century to propagate Newtonian physics in, uh, on the continent, um, supported living forces in the sense of uh, Gravesand and uh, Leibniz. Our modern uh, version in uh, classical uh, mechanics um, uh, requesting uh, um, that uh, the sum of potential energy and kinetic energy is con uh, constant. That came up in uh, the end of the 18th century in the framework of uh, analytical mechanics and uh, uh, the, um, considering uh, the conservation of quantities as consequence of uh, time symmetry here concerning energy that was, of course, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century with uh, Emmy uh, Noether. Now a last remark to variation principles. Um, you know, uh, in the history of uh, symmetries in physics, um, symmetry uh, principles were always uh, connected with speculations on a kind of world formula, how to explain uh, uh, the universe. And this kind of discussion uh, came up in the beginning of the 18th uh, century. Uh, here again uh, with uh, Leibniz in 1708, he introduced um, a variational principle of smallest action, which can have, that was his request, or uh, minima and uh, maxima. And um, it's interesting, uh, uh, the origin is on the background of his uh, metaphysical configurations in the teleological sense. The variation sh principle should be a mathematical expression of the universe as the best, most perfect of all possible worlds in the sense of his, of, uh, his uh, TODC. And uh, it's interesting, he is always uh, inspired by mathematics, even not only in physics, but uh, also in, uh, uh, in metaphysics. Now, uh, 40 years, nearly 40 years later, the French physicist Maupertuis uh, came up uh, with a, a new formulation of uh, the principle of smallest action as a universal principle of economy, he said. And he requests uh, uh, only minima, and that is in general, of course, false. And so uh, the correct formulation was given two years uh, before by uh, Leonard Euler here in a modern uh, formulation. Um, uh, perhaps you know, in the 18th century, in the beginning, there was a famous uh, a struggle on priority with many peoples were involved, even politicians, for example, the Prussian king, uh, Frederick uh, II. And uh, I will not go in these details here. Anyway, the variation principle had a fantastic career from uh, um, classical to modern physics. This is uh, 
uh, modern uh, formulation in the context of analytical um, uh, mechanics. The action of a physical system is the integral of the Lagrangian between instants of time and the path taken by the system between these uh, instants of time and configurations is the one for which the action is stationary. That means no change to a first order. And stationary action is not, only, it's not always a minimum, and in that sense, uh, uh, Moperto was uh, indeed false. When applied to the action of a physical system, the principle became a universal tool in modern physics that is not only true in uh, fluid dynamics, in uh, theory of relativity. I remind you the famous uh, argument in 1915 of uh, uh, David Hilbert and uh, Einstein, uh, but also in quantum mechanics, quantum electrodynamics, uh, the well-known uh, pass integral of uh, Feynman, uh, particle physics, string theory, and so on, to yield the equations of motions of that system. So the idea is uh, starting with the, variation, with the variation principle in order to introduce the equations of um, um, a physical uh, system, and then these equations are characterized by uh, symmetry uh, invariance. Now, uh, my last remark concerning perspectives of symmetry as research uh, principle, philosophical question, is symmetry only a semantic structure of physical theory uh, and uh, models, perhaps only in the sense of uh, uh, requests of uh, economy of uh, the human mind, or is uh, symmetry a real structure of the world? If it is only a semantic construction, why do observations, measurements, and predictions display these uh, regularities? And this is my uh, last foley until today, the birth of symmetries from a teleological, aesthetic, and economic spirit leads to the emergence of fruitful research principles that uh, solve real world problems. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very, very much for a wonderful presentation. Now it's time for questions and answer. Your, your penultimate question is, of course, the, the question that philosophically minded people and people who are interested in the science, uh, philosophy of science, are, are mostly interested in. Is it, you know, a beneficial economy or is it something that is true in a more fun material sense. So what's your own opinion? You, 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 I mean, you phrased the question very well, but what's your own take on it? You mean uh, uh, concerning the Middle Ages? No, what, what, what is your, so the, the one but last slide put the question very simple. Aha, there. aha, I see. What's the epistemic your, question. Yeah, yeah. My personal, yeah. my personal opinion. Um, no, it is more or less, it is very cautiously but uh, it is uh, more or less uh, formulated here. Um, uh, personally, I uh, believe, I assume that uh, symmetry has uh, still an uh, um, immense uh, meaning for reality. And now I argue as physicist, because you remember Galilei and others, uh, he was corrected by the church uh, that uh, his uh, ideas are accepted, but he must change to hypothesis. That, yeah, uh, hypothesis. And uh, no, uh, 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 Galilei argued, I'm a physicist, I'm interested in reality. And I know that, I'm also a philosopher. I know the arguments of the philosophers who um, uh, uh, underline that, uh, um, uh, uh, these are only uh, more or less uh, models. And um, uh, of course, we must be cautious. They, these concepts are models, and these are mathematical instruments. But in the end, a physicist is interested in the internal structure of uh, uh, reality. And so in that sense, I'm, uh, I'm uh, physically speaking, a realist in the sense of Galileo.
Yeah, so I admit I was a, a teensy bit late to this, so you might have discussed this already. But um, I was just interested, when you were talking about um, absolute space, Leibniz and Newton, whether you, how the Newton's bucket argument fits into that, whether that's relevant to this discussion around symmetries. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether you've got, I, I just because I missed this, you might discuss this already, so apologies if that's the case. Yeah. Um, I uh, tried to explain uh, and to illustrate this uh, old discussion in the uh, as end of the 17th and the 18th century on the background of uh, more or less modern mathematical representation. Uh, you remember I introduced with an old picture of uh, Leibniz and uh, uh, Newton and uh, uh, explained uh, their concepts in their words. And then my second folly was a mathematical representation of the, uh, uh, the structure of the space-time uh, in modern terms. Uh, and uh, then I uh, think we can uh, clarify uh, these uh, concepts and then it became obvious that actually there is no struggle from a modern physical mathematical point of view between Leibniz and uh, Newton because Leibniz was thinking in the direction of the energy concept and uh, Newton was thinking in the direction of force. In, in the sense of mechanics. But anyway, perhaps you, uh, let me illustrate that. Yeah. Uh, this reconstruction uh, of uh, kinetic energy or vis viva by integration, that was the idea here of, uh, of, New of uh, Leibniz, um, is reconstructed here uh, in uh, the framework of his calculus, but uh, consider this term, F, that is Newton. That is, in the argument of Leibniz, Newton was already involved. And so from a modern uh, uh, point of view, and that became obvious since the 8th of the 18th century in analytical mechanics by Lagrange and others, there is no uh, uh, contradiction because uh, energy is of course an important concept in even in uh, classical mechanics and the Newtonian force and they depend on one another. Um, and, and therefore I tried from the beginning uh, to give uh, reference to the historical documents but on the other side to explain it from a, a modern point of view. Uh, yes, that there is a question, middle. Play, please raise your hand. Thank you, Professor. Um, from a layman's point of view, uh, I understand that the, 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 this uh, symmetry must be a real structure of the world because the scientists have predicted through the concept of symmetry from matter to antimatter, from particles like electrons with the, with the, with the, with the same mass but a different charge, <coughs> the people have invented. So isn't it a real structure of the matter rather than the uh, concept of human mind? Yeah, that is of course a big question. Is the structure of the human mind, that's an old question, uh, or is it the structure of, uh, of the world? And uh, as I uh, explained before in the uh, first uh, uh, answering to the first uh, uh, question, um, on the one side, all these concepts are, of course, constructions of the human mind, obviously. Mathematics is an uh, invention, a wonderful invention of uh, the human mind, uh, just from the beginning. But uh, anyway, that's amazing. And uh, there is an, uh, a famous discussion with uh, Eugen Wigner. You know, uh, how uh, is it possible that mathematics uh, fits so wonderfully uh, uh, reality? Yes, and uh, Plato had an answer. Plato said, uh, we uh, can take part in uh, the structure of the world because it is an ideal world in itself. Reality is mathematics. That is a very strong argument. 
of sometimes even by mathemat mathematicians today uh, in the Platonic uh, uh, tradition. But um, coming from a more instrumental um, uh, approach to, uh, uh, to physics, there are the tools of uh, uh, mathematics and uh, combined with uh, experiments. And then at least we have the chance to, um, uh, to uh, explain um, events and uh, observations, and we are even able by these instruments to predict uh, future um, uh, events to uh, some, uh, some degrees. So both history, again, I would argue, actually there is no uh, uh, controversy between uh, realism and idealism, um, which was, uh, I think, uh, over-interpreted in, uh, in the philosophical, philosophical discussions uh, in the part. Actually, uh, there is a, a kernel of truth in both uh, approaches. That is my personal uh, view to that. We need to wait for the microphone. <laughs> Thank you for a whistle-stop lightning tour. Um, I was trying to keep up. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. I, 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 ultimately, I don't think it matters whether the idea of symmetry is real or just a helpful concept. Because as far as human beings are concerned, um, you know, we only see what we are able to see. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I agree with that, yes. May I ask you a question? Yeah. Because you mentioned uh, you have uh, two hats, let's say a philosopher and a physicist. What was the most challenging concept for you to deal with thinking about symmetry either as a philosopher or, you know, did you find something which um, kept, kept you awake? Yeah. <laughs> for this, this idea, I mentioned it in the beginning of my talk, came up to me uh, during my habilitation. My habilitation was on uh, uh, geometry and the continuum, and uh, that was very close to the ideas of uh, Hermann Weil. And uh, so uh, uh, he was my first hero, uh, and uh, absolutely um, fantastic. Um, so um, my first love is mathematics. And so perhaps you could observe that my sympathy for people like Leibniz and uh, Hermann Weil and, and so on, on this line. But on the other side, I was very impressed by the uh, real problem solving of physicists. Not only nice uh, theories, and so the connection or the tension between uh, these two worlds uh, are very exciting. And that is uh, here uh, brought to the point with uh, the symmetry uh, exception, and we will hear uh, during uh, our conference a lot of uh, these modern explanation of uh, 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 the expanding uh, universe and uh, uh, things like that. And for me, as a uh, philosopher and historian of science, uh, that is also a nice uh, illustration how um, uh, science is uh, uh, developing and starting with uh, um, very impressing ideas in the early early beginning of, uh, um, um, uh, of uh, mathematical science and uh, uh, philosophy. So I'm very eager to the go on discussion here yeah. in that conference. Thank you. More questions? Uh, by the way, uh, perhaps another um, uh, remark. Uh, before I wrote the mentioned book on symmetries, I was very impressed in uh, 1900 and... Uh, 82 or three, there was a conference in Spain uh, with the uh, still living Nobel Prize winners in physics uh, who were engaged in uh, the symmetry concept uh, development. Wigner, for example, or uh, uh, Gelman, Jehman, and uh, they were there and they were discussing with uh, young and old historians of uh, uh, physics, and that was for, for me personally, you asked me yeah. for the motivation, very impressive. 
uh, to uh, uh, consider. And it, the program was very similar to your program here. Uh, we started also with the historical stuff and then uh, conservation uh, law and uh, then up to hidden symmetries and uh, symmetry breaking in modern uh, um, uh, quantum physics and so on. Yeah. Thank you. An evergreen. <laughs> <laughs> So we would like to thank you very, very much for the wonderful presentation. Mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you.